Welcome to Aina Insights, where prominent leaders and influencers shaping the industrial and industrial technology sector discuss topics that are critical for executives, boards, and investors. Aina Insights is brought to you by Aina.ai, a firm focused on working with industrial companies to make them unrivaled segment of one leaders. To learn more about Aina.ai, please visit our website at www.aina.ai. Morning, folks. Welcome to another episode of our Titanium Economy podcast series hosted by Ina AI. Our guest today is Mr. Tom Ferguson, President and CEO of AZZ Inc. For over 10 years, Tom has led AZZ Inc. as a leader in the hot dip galvanizing and coil coating solutions to a broad range of end markets. Prior to serving as President and CEO of AZZ, Tom has had an almost 25 year career at FlowServe, a leading provider of flow control systems. While at FlowServe, Tom held a number of leadership roles across various business units and functions. Tom, welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you and are looking forward to talking about your journey as an organizational leader in the industrial space. Thanks, Connor. Glad to be here. Awesome. So before we get started, and for the, for the folks at home that aren't maybe as familiar with ACC and its products, could you provide a little bit of background on the, on the space that you guys play in? Sure. We're... Uh... We are the largest independent uh, metal coatings provider. Uh, we like to consider ourselves uh, a solution provider for hot dip galvanizing and, and coil coating uh, of sheet metal and, and including aluminum. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily know us uh, as such, but uh, you probably see our products anytime you're driving down the road, you're gonna see light poles, transmission poles, mm -hmm. probably the buildings are gonna have sheet metal that we've painted. Um, so while we're not a well-known name, we, we actually are the biggest in, in those two spaces. Yeah. So folks are, folks are touching your products every day. If not, uh, if, if they don't know the name. Yeah. As we like to say, we like things, make, like to make things last 50 to hundred years. And we also want to make them look good. Awesome. Awesome. And what are, I think you touched on some of the end markets and applications that you see your products going into. It sounds like a lot of infrastructure building, any other primary segments that, um, that you guys serve? Yeah, basically infrastructure construction. Uh, so, and a lot of infrastructure is construction. So, um, so that basic residential, commercial, industrial, you name it, when it comes to construction, we like to consider ourselves in it. Uh, so that could touch anything from petrochemical to the, to the uh, warehouse here, the Amazon warehouse you might see. Yeah. Uh, and then we're big in data centers and, any kind of electric utility, transmission, distribution, construction. Yeah. I actually read a Wall Street Journal article earlier this week about the the wave of, of that a lot of industrial companies are riding on the data center explosion that's happening across the country. So uh, very, very cool that you guys are, are in a front row seat to see that. Yeah, the nice part is we're we're not only in it directly, but we sold 60% of a business to that's now operating as a veil. And they're big in that same space, so they uh, they do the enclosures, the switch gear, the for the data centers, and and so it's it's great business these days. Yeah, awesome. So, so I'll continue to talk about AZZ here, but maybe switch uh, switch yeah. tracks slightly. Um, AZZ recently announced its succession plan for the CFO Philip Schlamm, which congratulations to to Philip on an excellent career. Yeah. Um, what are the, some of the things that your team knew that you needed to get right? To have a successful transition plan, and are, you know, are there are there some risks that are still outstanding or or being resolved? Yeah, we're very fortunate. You know, as a public company, obviously, we got to get our reporting right. We got to mitigate risk. We've got to uh, be able to report our numbers and, and keep tight controls in place. Uh, so the good news here is Philip gave us plenty of notice. Uh, he basically announced that he was going to retire at the end of his contract, which runs to November fourth. And we had a good, strong internal successor candidate uh, ready in the wings, so Jason Crawford. And it doesn't hurt that uh, Jason, we, when we acquired Free Coat Metals back in 22, uh, Jason was the, was the top financial uh, leader at that time for them. And he'd also been um, the top leader in, in Sequa, who was the uh, a Carlisle company that owned uh, Free Coat. So 
the transition has been very, very smooth. We're a quarter into it, and they are just checking off the boxes. We uh, recently were able to hire Jason's replacement at Precoat, uh, who mm-hmm. I think is joining us in, in a week. Uh, so usually, the, you know, those are always the risk is the team doesn't know each other. They don't. And, and in this case, Jason knows that entire team. Uh, Philip had built a really strong uh, group here. And Jason had a strong team up at Precode in St. Louis. So they just came off of a brainstorming session where they're putting a lot of these things together. So we basically check all, all the boxes um, that you want to focus on, which is knowledge of the business, understanding the control, understanding what a public, public company has to do uh, for the controls and to be in compliance. And then how do you support the businesses from a FP&A financial uh, an analytics perspective. So yeah. we're excited about it. Uh, I think uh, Philip, he's actually got some free time to focus on. Uh, I think he finally took a vacation, which is kind of nice to see. So, yeah. so we feel real good about it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, and that that actually um, it kind of sets up my my next question. Well, is is that AZZ? Um, you know, had an acquisition of, of the the pre code yeah. business in in twenty two. Um, that gave you access to the, kind of that coil coatings market and market is obviously res- the public markets have responded very well in ACC stock mm-hmm. in the past two years. Um, how has that integration come along? It sounds like the, the personnel part was a, was a huge kind of, you know, not surplus windfall from that to be able to um, have that contribute to the succession plan. What are some of the other, I guess, components of the that integration and how they're, how they're going? Yeah, I think fortunately, the, the people side of it, the leadership side of it, the cultures immediately meshed. One of, one of the things I loved about touring their facilities, meeting their team uh, before we even completed the acquisition was just how compatible we were in our style, our approach to business, our approach to people, developing people, uh, leadership and, and management philosophy. Mm-hmm. So that was great. We're both coding businesses. Uh, I'd had the opportunity to kick the tire, so to speak, on Preco back in 2018. So it was a business that I was attracted to back then. So, mm-hmm. you know, the ability to bring these two teams together and, and also tremendous talent on both sides. Uh, so, and leaders in their respective spaces. So when I look at it, um, what could have been complexity turns into our opportunity. We also were able, as I mentioned, divest uh, what was more of a holding company. It was kind of a mini conglomerate, uh, about eight or 10 different business units doing different things. Um, you know, to divest that into the private space, which, which uh, was outstanding. So that freed our team and corporate up to focus on how do we bring these two great businesses together? How do we grow them faster? How do we deploy capital uh, more wisely? And, and our focus initially was on paying down debt because ACZ had never had a lot of debt. We were about 1.5 times levered on EBITDA uh, and, and we popped up to over four. So focusing on how do you manage your cash flows and yet continue to invest in your businesses. Um, so we had put uh, acquisitions off to the side and focused on paying down debt, investing in the businesses. We did uh, announce a huge uh investment, $125 million investment in building a new facility up uh, outside of St. Louis in Washington, Missouri. And we have a partner on that, a customer who had who contractually committed to 75% of that volume. Mm-hmm. And it's on schedule uh, and, and running, you know, we're hoping to have it up and in, in doing some test runs here uh, at the end of the summer. So nothing but exciting things as, as we look at it. Uh, but yeah, it was a big step for us. Uh, and followed by the another big step, which was divesting uh, the, the successful, what we call a, uh, AZZ infrastructure solutions. Yeah. So we're excited at this point, excited about the future uh, and, and focused on how do we continue to grow and, and deploy capital uh, well. Yeah. So that facility that you mentioned, um, that's, is that a, that's it sounds like an organic growth. Is that off of the, the yeah. solution acquisition or was that core to the, the galvanizing business? Yeah, that was pre code. This was something that they had, had in the in the wings and, and been focused on. Uh, but being a private company, they they had not pulled the trigger on it. So when we looked at it, it's it's in the aluminum space, which is a growing, you know, aluminum cans. <laughs> 
So all my wife drinks now is aluminum can water. <laughs> um, so we we like it because we'll now be providing paint for uh, for prepaint solutions for things like that, Con uh, aluminum containers, and uh, so we see it as a growth track as as it kind of replace some of the plastic options. Um, and it's like, as I mentioned, we we haven't announced who the partner is yet, but uh, but it's it's a top aluminum company. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting angle. You know, the the inorganic growth allow it gives you more places to leverage your status as a public co public company and deploy that capital mm -hmm. in, in into new markets. Um, how does I guess it sounds like that's the immediate next step. Um, mm -hmm. Are there are there other kind of thoughts about future expansion in the in the world of coatings, or it's maybe one step at a time with with this uh, this facility first. Now nah, we tend to plan plan pretty far out. So, uh, you know, we're back on the acquisition trail for the most part. We we've grown. We call almost call it organically. We bolt on one off galvanizing sites to our metal coatings group. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're we've put the flag back up that uh, after two years of, of focusing on debt reduction, we're back in the acquisition space. Uh, there's also larger acquisitions that we obviously will court. We were fortunate that a couple of processes. Uh, shortly, well, as we were going through the process to, to acquire Precoat, a couple of large, larger opportunities came available. Uh, fortunately, the for us, the process has failed, and uh, hopefully, they come back available again some other day. So, we're excited about that. Awesome. Very cool. Well, and also, we've got a lot of technology we've been applying, digital technology, uh, which, by the way, is something we love about Ina. I mean, it's uh, you know great for the digital space for AI. Uh, we've been doing that for about seven or eight years on the galvanizing side. So we are far more automated and digitally um, integrated than any of our competition, which we believe gives us differential advantage, uh, allows us to be far more integrated with our customers and mm -hmm. provide that value. Um, and we're doing some of the same things on the freak out side. They've got what's called coil zone. Uh, so we're going to continue to invest in those things, which is just continuing to to make us closer to our customers and give them solutions that we like to think our competition can. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes such a, you know, as as consumer technology becomes so much richer, it, it trickles over into what B2B customers expect. You know, they're, yeah. they're used to this ultra level of convenience and accessibility that they get in DoorDash and Uber Eats and you know, it's starting to starting to get the same standards being applied and measured mm -hmm. to um, those same folks doing their their day jobs. So it's great to see that uh, that ACC is is ready to meet those those changing demands. Um, so I'd love to I'd love to switch tack a little bit here from talking to ACC to about uh, you know infrastructure in the U.S. largely as as you are a, mm -hmm. you know leading supplier of, of a lot of those inputs. I'd love to get your assessment of the state of U.S. infrastructure, like where are there, you know, where are there bright spots, areas of improvement? How are we compared to maybe other economic competitors? Any any light that you could shed there would be would be super fascinating. Yeah, I think there's multiple areas. So as you think about just the basic infrastructure, we usually think of bridge and highway. As I mentioned, the electrical transmission distribution, you know, everywhere you see the high wires and things like that. But now you got buried cables. Um, those are areas where the country has needed huge investments. Um, and you see where people are moving here in Texas. You can't get, a, get in your car and drive down the road without seeing construction going on, whether it's bridges, highways, um, or just roads and, and, um, and sidewalks. So that's all really good to see the, uh, through the IIJA, the providing some investment, because I do think um, it's going to take billions, if not probably trillions, to get us to a competitive universally cap uh, universal capability in terms of infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we've got the water systems. We've got everything from electrical cars. How are you going to get charging stations out there? Almost all of this plays well to us. Um, yeah. Data centers, you, you mentioned, because if you're going to have, you know, lots of um, continue to build out anything from cryptocurrency to uh, to you name it. It's going to take electricity. It's going to take data um, systems, data centers. And so we see this finally really being built out in, in uh, 
both the CHIPS Act as well as IIJA, those funds are now getting deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing them show up in projects. I still think we're in kind of the early innings. So this should be a good long tail if you look out over the next decade, uh, yep. providing tailwinds for companies like AZZ. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting position the U.S. is in, you know, compared to some other emerging economies, because it's a, it, you know, there's some new build, but there's also how do you revamp an existing infrastructure versus other companies that are, or sorry, other countries that are coming online. Yeah. The new age, it's it's new build. You're starting with a with a blank canvas, so um, I'm sure that that poses its own kind of kind of complications. How do we build around what we've already got? It's true because there's always a tendency to just want to build over it. Uh, but in this case, we need integrated solutions, which also, as I mentioned, plays well to us. You're seeing more of the warehouses and, you know, everywhere you go, distribution is is king now. So because we all want it now <laughs> yeah. and we want what we want now. So those distribution centers tend to have a lot of prepaid and metal on them. Uh, just like uh, the new chips plants. So massive amounts of painted sheet metal, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, all of which it, it's easier to construct, it's higher quality, and and you can get projects done quicker. Yeah. No, exciting time, certainly, for uh, for infrastructure building in the U.S. over the years to come. So switching tracks again, you know, would love to, yeah. as we talk about the industrial space overall, would love to kind of, you know, on maybe a more personal note, understand if there are any uh, names or organizations in the industrial space that you enjoy following or you think are, are doing really interesting things. You know, it's interesting because I, I I mentioned Ina, which uh, obviously I've had a long relationship with Nick Santham and um, I'll some say of the folks, things that folks at home, we didn't, we didn't pay him to say that. So it's, uh, I, they, you did it. Uh, <laughs> but I, I find Nick has been just a great, partner advisor, if you will. And, and uh, Fernwa bought uh, the majority of, of uh, AIS, now called Avail. And that that's an interesting company because I'm watching what they're doing um, in the industrial space and growing enclosures and, and switch gear and, and electrical things are just taking off. Uh, but, you know, so there you go from more of a kind of a mini conglomerate to focus coatings. Um, I hesitate to mention any of our large customers. I do respect, uh, have great respect for the the SDIs and and, and some of the the steel metal manufacturers, and uh, because I think it all starts with metal, and we've got to have that capability in in our country to provide it, um, and that's kind of the source in terms of almost all all uh, industrial construction activity. Um, so when I'm thinking about it, it's it's I should have better answers to that. I like uh, one of the the companies I'm at because it's transportation, so Wabash. Uh, but I also like uh, great all of the when you think about trucks and trailers and and everything to move uh, products across the country. Um, that's fits right in with. Infrastructure fits right in with then how do you transit uh, the country and get products across it? So, uh, and, and then how do we utilize technology going forward? So, so that's kind of the ones I think about. There's, there's, there's so many that fit our customer base. By mentioning one name, I almost exclude others. You know, so yeah. I'm just being a little cautious right now. <laughs> it's like the Oscar acceptance speech. You don't want to. You want to thank everyone, but you know, there's the there's the. Don't want to alienate anybody. So. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. But I, I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Um, awesome. So we like to end on like a little bit of a, a little bit of a fun question here. I know you're um, Dallas Fort Worth based. If if that's yeah. correct. So. I don't know if you watched the the Mavericks game last night, but your uh, your Mavericks are, are one game away from the the NBA Finals for the first time in ten years. Are you uh, are you tuning in? Do you do you like them over the Celtics, or how do we feel, yeah, we, Dallas? We, we we've had a good run. So we had the Rangers win the World Series last year, and then we've got uh, so now we have both the Stars and the Mavs. Uh, the Mavs are up two to one, or Mavs are up three to one, yeah. and should have won last night, but. Uh, Tough, tough finish, but it's yeah. okay. Get them back home, and, uh, and then we're we're hoping for the stars because uh, my wife became a hockey fan back in 1999 when they won their first, actually I think first and only uh, Stanley Cup. So the only thing we uh, we lag on is uh, 
you know, our, our Cowboys haven't, haven't seemed to find a way to compete. So yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're coming. They just need the, the Mavs and the stars to show them the way. And they'll, uh, I'm sure they'll be in, in hot pursuit. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Awesome. Yeah, we're excited. So we could have two, uh, you know, two, two uh, contenders here in, uh, in the finals. Very cool. Well, I'm, I'm sure the, the country will be watching uh, excitedly. Um, in the meantime, Tom, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the discussion. It's been, uh, been really enlightening. And, uh, and for the folks at home, thanks again for, for tuning into another episode of the Titanium Economy. Take care. All right. Thanks, Connor. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to Ina Insights. Please visit Ina.ai for more podcasts, publications, and events on developments shaping the industrial and industrial technology sector.